about eight years ago, I tried to start a business. Now, I say tried because it didn't really go too well. It failed miserably, really. You see, the people I thought would hire me, they didn't even want to try what I had to offer. So what was I offering? It was very simple. I wanted my clients, I wanted to help my clients to design, build, and sell homes that were warm, sunny, dry, quiet, you know, comfortable. But it didn't work. It didn't work. And I guess when you start a business, you need to be at peace with the idea that it might fail. And I was. What I was absolutely not expecting to hear, though, was the reason it failed. Because they didn't tell me the economy was tight or that I was charging too much or that they didn't trust me. What they said was that us, you, know, you, me, people, that we don't care about these things. We don't care about comfort. And I was shocked by this to the point that I've been studying this topic ever since. And today I'd like to share with you some of the things I've learned in this time. Starting from perhaps the most shocking one, which is that people do care about these things. <laughs> I know it sounds obvious, but let me put this in perspective for you. 21% of the whole world's emissions, bah, energy consumption, sorry, goes into housing. And a lot of it goes into heating, cooling, lighting, ventilating. It's quite a lot. And this obviously has an environmental side. All this, emission, all this energy consumption is causing emissions. And 6.6% of the whole world's emissions are explained by just heating, cooling, and lighting of housing. Not theaters, not supermarkets, housing. This is 3.5 times the amount of emissions of the aviation industry. 350% if you prefer. Or it's 14% larger than the livestock farming industry in terms of emissions. So this comfort sector that nobody seems to be talking about, they talk about housing, this is the comfort sector. It's quite big. But there's hope. We can reduce these 6.6% of emissions by offering people something they want, which is comfortable homes. You see, we don't heat, we don't cool, we don't like for sport or for us a hobby. We do it when we think we need it. So if you gave people comfortable homes, they would be happier, they would save money, and this would be better for the environment without the need to grab a stick and poke people so they do things they don't want to do, which is something, a trade-off we all find fine. The problem is that to do this, we need to agree on what a comfortable home is. Can we agree on that? I think we can, but there's a trick. You see, a lot of the time when I talk about this, my research or what I've been doing, people say, well, can you just stop talking? Can you just draw that house that's comfortable? Can you just give me the list of features that I need to install? But that's not how it works. People would need different homes. Different people need different homes. They're not massively different, but they're different. So what's the right approach, I think? Don't study housing, study comfort. Study the experience of comfort. Let's understand what makes people comfortable or uncomfortable. And by doing that, once you understand comfort, with a little bit of empathy, you can start to say, hey, I think this home is good for you. I can imagine you living here, and it seems all right. Or maybe this home is good for you, or for me, or for students, or for people who are renting, and so on. And I know this sounds ambitious, right? We're still talking about a big word, comfort. What does that mean? Well, it means something simpler than you might think. In fact, I'm going to argue that comfort is just about three things. Perceptions, expected outcomes, and trade-offs. And I know it's, this is jargon, but I'm going to explain to you in a minute. So by the end of this talk, they're not going to be jargon, hopefully. So let me illustrate these three things using three short stories that I heard during my research. First story, it's summer, it's midday. You're in your kitchen, you're preparing lunch. Okay? Your kitchen is full of daylight, everything's quiet, you have your window open, so you can only hear a soothing sound of the birds and the trees. Suddenly someone knocks on your door and you go and check it out because you're not expecting anyone. And you open the door and you see your neighbor and she says, hey, Sorry about the noise last night. We were celebrating my birthday. Now you, you don't know what she's talking about because you didn't hear anything. But you say, well, don't worry, it wasn't too bad. It's all right. 
and, and you keep going with your business. Now, this story is about perceptions, which is an assessment of the here and now. We want to know whether we are now comfortable or not. Do I like it here or not? And this story has two elements. On the one hand, there's the kitchen. On the other one, there's the neighbor. Okay? The kitchen I described using the concepts we use today to describe comfort in buildings. Building codes, software, professional standards all use concepts like this. The right light, the right temperature, the right sound, the right humidity. OK, so that makes sense. Let's take him out of the way. Let's now focus on the neighbor, because we have studied her experience remarkably little. She was worried about making you uncomfortable. And this is remarkable, because suddenly acoustic comfort is not just about not hearing unwanted noises. It's about also being able to make noises. We want to be able to live our lives without bothering other people. <clears throat> and suddenly comfort is not just what our eyes or our ears or skin can sense is about the meaning we give to these things. It's about what our minds tell us based on all these inputs. I can't know whether, whether you are hearing me, but I think you are, and I don't like that. Second story. It's winter. You are going back home from work in the bus. It's dark, it's raining. You know your home is going to be cold. You know it's going to be dark. Now, you don't make a big deal about this because you have a heater that you can switch on and you have lights that you can turn on. Now, what you didn't expect was when you got home, you tried to switch on your heat pump and it didn't work. And suddenly, the situation doesn't look too good, does it? You don't feel colder, but you do feel uncomfortable. And this is a story of what I call the expected outcomes, what we think is going to happen in the future, whether we like what we see, what we see coming. You see, people are always aware of the future. We're always aware of the future, to the point that sometimes we're willing to tolerate discomfort now if we see a nice future coming, and the other way around as well. So a comfortable home doesn't really need to offer the right conditions 100% of the time. What it really needs to do, what we want, is to know that we are, gonna, that we are not going to be forced to tolerate discomfort for prolonged periods of time. And a great way of offering that is giving you windows heaters, lights, things you can switch on and off whenever you feel uncomfortable. Third story, you're renting a house, which I saw that many of you raised your hands when you were asked. It has a lot of character, which obviously means that when winter comes, it's going to be cold, <laughs> right? And it's cold, and it's hard to heat, it's difficult to heat. And you don't want to spend all that money. And you're busy, you're tired, you have other things to do. So you decide that for this winter, just for this winter, you're going to go with the simplest solution. You're going to grab your, heat, your heater, you're going to walk to your bedroom, you're going to close your door, and you're going to hibernate there. Right? I heard these stories many more, many more times than I would have liked that. It's true. Now, this is a story about trade-offs. Sacrifices we make, compromises we make to achieve comfort. Or sometimes, even if my colleagues don't like this, we sacrifice comfort very consciously, rationally, to achieve something else. We choose to, be, to feel cold because we want to do something else with the money, for instance. So these are, uh, in this case, you're warm in your bedroom, right? But you sacrifice your kitchen, your living room. You sacrifice your freedom. You're paying for a full house. You're using only a portion of it. You could run economical, you know, financial calculations on that. So these are the three things that determine our comfort. Perceptions, which is the present. Expected outcomes, which is what we think is coming and trade-offs, the context, the rest of our lives. Because we have only one brain, only one mind, which we use to assess the whole thing, not just temperature. We don't wake up one day and say, oh, this is a thermal day. I'm going to focus on temperature. But I'm sure you knew all this, didn't you? You knew that cold was unpleasant. I don't, I'm not here to tell you that. You knew that not having a heater when you know it's going to be cold is kind of annoying. And you know that some of us, at least, care about not bothering our neighbors. We don't like that. And that's the thing. Comfort is first and foremost a human experience. Understanding comfort is about thinking like a human. It's an act of empathy. So most of the results, most of the findings from comfort research are not supposed to surprise you. They, look, they should look obvious, or at least relatable. Like, oh, well, maybe that's not my position, but I could totally understand someone doing that. So comfort research is not supposed to tell you what you should like or to change you. It's about 
giving a structure to our understanding of comfort. Because comfort is still a big word, even if it's a human experience. It's hard to describe. So what comfort does is to cut this monster of a word, comfort research does, is cutting this monster of a word into pieces that we can understand bit by bit. In doing so, we create concepts, connections between these concepts. We create a language. And with the language, we can discuss comfort, buy comfort, sell comfort, legislate comfort. It's impossible to sell a comfortable home if we don't know what comfort is, why people want it, or how to communicate. That's not going to work. So let me give you a short demonstration of this in action. Okay, we're going to run a test that I make up for this talk. It's not, a real, not an official thing. But we're going to evaluate your homes. Don't talk, okay? just follow along in your minds. We're going to start with perceptions. If your home is cold, hot, dark, too humid, too noisy, those are perceptions. And we know a lot about those perceptions in particular. You can call a professional. There's tons of things we can do about them. Changing the windows, installing insulation, moisture barriers, shading devices, whatnot. Now, whatever you've been offered, you need to give it meaning from your own perspective. So for example, for me, feeling cold, what, what does it mean to feel cold? When I'm alone in my home, feeling cold is just feeling cold. That's about it. When my children are with me, I care about them. I don't want them to get sick. And suddenly, I become less tolerant to cold. I do more to avoid cold. I heat more often. My behavior changes. My consumption, my energy consumption changes. Then we can follow with expected outcomes, which is really just about four questions. Just four questions. The first one is, do you think your home is going to be comfortable forever? And I, for the engineers here, I'm not talking about your simulation results. Okay? This is about people trusting that their homes are going to be fine and comfortable forever. If not, which is the most likely situation, is do you have the means to solve potential problems? Do you have heaters, windows, ventilation systems, lights, the hood in the kitchen for when you burn something? The third question is, are you actually going to use these things? Not everyone can just stand up and open a window. right? Not everyone trusts ventilation systems. Some people just think they don't work enough. Because when you open a window, you can feel the air. When you switch on some things, on the, you, know, you don't feel anything a lot of the time. And then the fourth question is, grab all the things you can't control. All those things you're going to have to tolerate in your home. And ask yourself, how annoying are they? Do they happen once a year for an hour? Do they happen every day for two hours? It's a different story. I'm not going to tell you what you should like, but you can ask yourself that question. Then the final part is about trade-offs. And this is about statements in the following structure. I would like to do A, but I don't do it because of B. But C could solve that issue. Or I don't like doing A, but I need to do it because of B. And C could actually solve this issue. I don't open the windows because I fear that the insects might come in. A fly screen can solve that issue. I don't open the windows because I think my children are going to run out of the window Change your windows. There's different kinds of windows. Right? I don't open this curtain even if I would like to have the daylight coming in. Because of privacy, maybe a frosted glass can do it for you. So by asking yourself these kind of questions, just go home and write these things down. You can start to discuss and analyze your home and the comfort of your home in a much more detailed way than, way than if I just told you, hey, how comfortable is your home? And that's the role of comfort research, to give us tools, to give, it a, to give us a language to discuss these things. So I'd like to invite you all to not wait for the final version of these tools to come up. Not wait for the whole comfort research to be done, because there is more to do. But again, comfort is first and foremost a human experience. So if you've been a human for long enough, and you have some empathy, you can start making decisions that improve your life and those of your family and friends right now. Thank you very much. Thank you.